Good day, my lovely listeners. You are listening to the Forty Orty Podcast. Tune in every week to explore inspiring stories and insightful information that dive headfirst into the world of autism and mental health. With all those tantalizing tongue twisters out of the way, let's get into the show. Good day, my wonderful people, and welcome back again to the 40 OT podcast with your host today, Mr. Thomas Henley, as usual. It's a, it's a bit of a glum day today in, in good, good old UK, or at least up north. I have recently come down with a bit of sickness. Um, I think there's a bug going around in my local area because it seems that my both my girlfriend and brother have, have both got pretty sick from it. But I am all good, so uh, don't worry about me. <laughs> today we have a podcast with none other than Purple Ella. And we're going to be talking about late diagnosis of autism, what it looks like, the kind of things that you can expect, the things that perhaps may be holding you back from going and getting a diagnosis. Ella is uh, an amazing person to talk to, and um, I won't talk too much. So Ella, how are you doing today? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm a little bit tired, to be honest. Um, But feeling good about uh life in general i think good so that's really great to hear would you like to give up everybody a little bit of a, a background into the the kind of work that you do who am i um yeah <laughs> so uh yeah i i am a late diagnosed autistic adult i was diagnosed in my mid 30s and i'm also the mother to two autistic children and another child who isn't autistic who i always feel like i need to mention because i'm like two autistic <laughs> children but i actually have three children um and when i got my autism diagnosis i have a background as a performer i was actually a circus artist in my former life really um, i did not yeah. know that yeah, so uh, yeah, so I used to do acrobatics and juggling and, you know, street performing, stage performing. I guess I just like performing, always have done. So when I got my diagnosis, I, I guess I started making YouTube videos as a way partly to kind of process. I'm a verbal processor, mm. so part, partly as a way to process my experience that I was having, but also partly to share my experience thinking like it might benefit other people in a similar situation because at that time, it wasn't an unusual thing to be the mother of an autistic child, realizing that you mm. yourself are also autistic, right? Um, so that was seven years ago. That'll be seven years ago in June. And since then, it's kind of become my job, which is wild. Uh, so I make content on a variety of social platforms now, YouTube, mostly YouTube and TikTok, but also a little bit on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, and I also make content for other people. So I'm, I made a video for the NHS recently for um, people who are training in supporting autistic people in crisis. So crisis services, inpatient services, wow. they commissioned me to make a video for them to use as part of their training so that I can actually tell all those doctors and nurses in those situations what we <laughs> actually need them to do, which is we, amazing. We do need that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great to be able to do stuff like that where you feel like you're actually maybe even affecting systemic change, you know. Um, and uh, I made some content recently for clinical partners. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how they're going to use it. I think it's going to be on YouTube. I'll keep people posted. But that was a super fun experience where I got to not do any of the, you'll know as a podcast host, you're the promoter, you're the artist, you're the yeah. scripter, you're yeah. the editor. In this yeah. case, I, I was able to just turn up and say things and someone else is doing all the rest of the work. So. That is the dream. That Living is the, the dream. dream. Yeah. So I also do consultancy, public speaking. Basically, I've got my fingers in a lot of pots, but I suppose I'm specifically interested in mental health and autism, uh, gender experience and autism, because my eldest autistic child is trans and I am non-binary. And... I'd also really like to get my finger into the pot of the justice system at some point because mm. I feel like there's a lot of mm. ADHDers sitting in the justice system and I'd like to understand why and what I can do to help there. So I'm just I'm just doing everything that I can really to support autistic people um as part of my own journey learning about my own, you know, neurodivergence. Well from from what you from what you're telling me it sounds like we're we're quite similar in our in our focuses because mental health and autism tends to be like 
the the top thing for me to kind of tackle. It's a it's a really big issue, isn't it, in the in the in the autistic community. One thing that I wanted to to ask you about because um, on Instagram your name is Purple Ella and Coco, mm-hmm. and before yeah. before we got here to to chat, I had a look at your YouTube channel and your video about autism assistance dogs. Would you like to tell everybody a little bit about what it is like to have a Coco in your life? Yeah, I mean, I can talk about dogs all day long. So happy to dive into that one. Yeah, so I've had Coco since she was a puppy and um, have owner trained her as my assistance dog with the support of an organisation that supports with things like um, trainers and insurance and stuff to help you do that with in a kind of supported way. Did that make any sense? <laughs> um, yeah. So I would say working with Coco is has been life changing for me in that I'm now able to like attend hospital appointments and go shopping and stuff on my own, where previously I would have had to have made my husband take the day off work and come and mm-hmm. do it with me. Um, but it, it but it isn't without its, its challenges. So I always like to say that, like on the one hand, I've got this amazing support and relationship with this animal that I absolutely adore and who is the most uncomplicated relationship that I have in that I'm never worrying you know you're autistic I'm never worrying (laughs) does she like me did I say the wrong thing what does that facial expression mean you know she's just like solidly consistently the way she is and she doesn't answer back and she never disagrees with me which I love yeah yeah exactly but on the other hand especially if you're owner training an assistance dog and especially if you're quite a black and white thinker they're not perfect not even guide dogs for the blind are perfectly behaved all the time and I think I kind of thought they were before I became an assistance dog handler I kind of thought an assistance dog was just almost like a robot that never had a bad day right but they do they have bad days and sometimes the training doesn't work and that can be really frustrating and no matter how I'm feeling I've got to walk her and I've got Mm. to care for her you know which can be a good thing because it kind of keeps you motivated, but can also be a bit of a challenge. Um, but for me, I, I absolutely love working with Coco. And I'm also the ambassador, one of the ambassadors for Dogs for Autism, who are a charity in the UK who provide fully trained assistant d- dogs to autistic people of all ages, yeah. which is awesome because actually all the other charities are doing brilliant work, but no one's working with autistic adults mm. apart from these guys in the UK. Yeah, I, I kind of I kind of really care about this. Yeah, project. I think the the looking after and the walking and the the feeding is because um, I I've you know thought about getting an an assistance dog because throughout my life I've had I mean my 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 big brother was a dog lovely lovely mongrel from the from the kennel called Bob <laughs> called him Bobby Dog great dog name and um, he uh, <laughs> I think he I think he lived up until he's about. 14 or 15 and um he was he was definitely like a massive emotional support for me i think the the issue the issue mm-hmm. for me comes in that i still haven't sorted out all the executive functioning issues that i have and you know even getting myself to eat and getting myself out to a walk would be difficult <laughs> one one thing that i that i sort of picked up when you were, you were talking about um autism assistance dogs is that You've had a lot of difficulties with accessing venues, places that you know should should be accessible. And I think you said in the video that there's you know denying someone who has an assistance dog into into a venue is you know against the law. It's it's a reasonable adjustment. Have you had have you had many experiences like that, or is it more of an isolated? Yeah. Thing? No, unfortunately, it does happen regularly. And I kind of thought it was maybe happening regularly to me because I work with a dog that doesn't look like most assistance dogs you see kind of black labs or golden retrievers, right? Whereas Coco is a small, fluffy dog. So I thought maybe it's that. Maybe people aren't used to seeing that. But I've been following um, YouTuber Molly Burke, who is um, blind, Mm -hmm. and she works with a guide dog, and she has access problems. And I'm like, if someone with the most well-known, most obviously working dog is having problems with access. We all are, right? Yeah. Um, so what I've started to do is I have, I found it really stressful for the first year or so of working with Coco, having to explain every time, actually, we are covered by the equality law. Actually, you do have to let us in. And, you know, dealing with that was, 
like almost more anxiety provoking than not having the dog in some instances. <laughs> yeah. I think there was one particular memorable instance when I wasn't allowed to do a COVID PCR test with her. They just wouldn't let me in. And not only would they not let me in, but they were quite aggressive in their manner with me. So that was quite stressful. Oh. So after that particular incident with a big kind of beefy bouncy guy oh, not letting me God. in. Like- <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Go on, it was go a lot. On. It was a lot. <laughs> After that, I realised that what I could do was, and this is kind of anyone that's got a dog assistance dog, you can do this. Is uh, I got from Etsy a card that has a QR code that I can literally just go, just scan this, and it takes them to a place where all the law around assistance dogs is explained. And since nice. I've been using that, it's gotten a lot easier because I'm just like, here's my card, just do. It. And half the time they don't even scan it; they're just like, all oh, right, okay then. Hmm. But it saves, I think as an autistic person, anything that saves the need to do more communication than I <laughs> have to is a helpful thing. Yeah, especially with yeah. bouncers. I um, I have a particular aversion to uh, any security or security staff or bouncers because um, I'm very heavily PDA and I find it really difficult to... <laughs> like, there's been sometimes that sometimes when I've gone to like the pub with my friends or or something and if and it's uh, I I always find I always find myself getting very on edge and very annoyed when, I, when I'm around the security stuff. Yeah, well, I'm not going to say that I walked away shouting words that I wouldn't use in this podcast <laughs> at this guy in the end. That might have been what happened. <laughs> oh, they're just so. I could go. I could go on about it forever, but yeah, he basically treated me like I was a precious Karen, and I think that's. I think as a, as a white female presenting middle aged person, mm. the Karen kind of meme or however you would describe it has not been helpful for me because, for example, like a couple of days ago, I was having to say to someone, "Why don't you have a blue badge parking space, a disabled parking space? Mm. I needed one. You don't have one. You've got a twenty, t- twenty car park cart." Blah. You've got a 20 car, I can't say it, (laughs) 20 car car park. You should have a, and the way they treated me was like I was being a Karen. And I wasn't saying, mate, my coffee isn't the right temperature. I was saying I have an access need that you're not meeting, but I feel like I get that vibe a lot. And this security guard was definitely Mm. giving me that. I just think you're a precious, you know, Karen type. I can can imagine that you, you have to, you have to deal with those circumstances where, People don't let you in because of because of Coco a lot. So I imagine that it's quite it's like, oh, here we go again. Like, <laughs> honestly, I think the biggest problem is not so much that because at least in that situation, I know that the law is on my side. I've talked yeah. about it enough now to know that the law is on my side yeah. and that I can handle it. The biggest problem is people who want to pet her. Yes, I get so every single time I leave the house with my assistant's dog. 50% of the people we come across will want to pet her or interact with her. And that's really difficult because I've spent a long time training her to ignore people oh. when we're working. Mm. So if they're trying to do that, that's a really mixed message for her. And so then I'm having to say to people, sometimes like really cute elderly people or people with children, <laughs> you know, so you feel awful. Like, actually, can you just ignore her? And I don't know how to say it in a way. And because I'm autistic, I don't know how I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to say it in a way that doesn't sound mean. Yeah. And I find that that's probably the biggest problem more than the kind of access thing. So if anyone listening to this podcast takes anything away from what I'm saying, it's if you see a service dog or an assistance dog working, don't even look at them. Just ignore them. I suppose there's a lot of unexpected and unwanted social interaction when you're just kind of wanting to go out for a day. But dog dogs are definitely a, a magnet to a lot of people. <laughs> Yeah. Which, I mean, it can be good. I don't want to leave on an entirely negative. It can be a positive. It can mean that I have a nice little social interaction with someone with a very scripted, easy you know, yeah, topic. Yeah. But in general, if you see me about with my dog, if you could just ignore us, that would be brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant. I'm thinking now might be a good time to, to get into the meat of the podcast to talk about a late diagnosis. Sure. As a, a person who was diagnosed at the age of 10, I don't have a lot of experience with, I, I can sort of imagine what, what it what it may be like because when I got diagnosed, I didn't have access to all the resources that I have today, like the the knowledge and the, the experiential um, knowledge from other people. And so it was only until 
in my twenties that I really started to kind of process what autism was and how it made me different and you know all of that kind of stuff so what i want to know is what was your life experience like up until the point you realized that you were autistic and what changed yeah okay that that is a big question it is a big Um, question yeah (laughs) and i don't want to be entirely negative because obviously you know life is a series of emotions and ups and downs and there were good bits you know but it did I'd say I don't I don't really remember my childhood a huge amount which apparently is quite common in autistic people or so my therapist tells me Mm -hmm. um but I would say from my teenage years I definitely had a real strong feeling that I wasn't good enough that whatever I was doing wasn't working and that my main aim was to try and be more like the people who were winning at life Mm -hmm. right so I spent kind of my teens and my 20s trying to be somebody else or trying to build an acceptable personality that would stop people from like taking an instant disliking to me you know I would often feel that not everybody of course Mm -hmm. I had friends and you know I met I married my husband during that time but um I just there would there would just too regularly be times when people would just like bit like within five minutes be like oh my god this person is so annoying or so whatever and I just felt like I was getting it wrong and that was really depressing and so at the same time I guess I started experiencing mental health problems in my late teens early 20s you know depression anxiety um it just felt like life was a struggle and my main aim in life was to figure out what on earth was wrong with me so that I could be better and happier Mm. um and during that time I also had three children and so I went through pregnancy and childbirth and postnatal um, postnatal experience without the knowledge that I'm autistic. Mm. And that was really, really hard because now that I look back on that and I think, you know, of the struggles that I had, because when you have a baby, your whole routine is just like gone. <laughs> there is no routine. There is nothing in your life that looks the same as it did yesterday when you were still pregnant, sure. you know? Um And going through that, not knowing I was autistic. And so just experiencing the way that, as I'm sure you can imagine, you would freak out if that happened to you without the knowledge of why this was happening to my brain or why I was kind of having these experiences was really, really hard. Um, And the other thing that I'd say was really hard was I'm I'm a meltdowner. You don't meet many adult meltdowners. So it's a little bit. I'm I'm happy to put my hand up. I'm, I'm an adult meltdowner as well amazing most people are like oh yeah I don't really melt down I shut down I'm like no you'll know about it when I go (laughs) so uh but like having meltdowns but having no idea they were meltdowns makes you feel like maybe you're just a bad person Mm. who loses their you know loses their I'm trying to find words that aren't swear words um loses their sense of like rationality Mm. on a regular basis and so I would be looking at other people and being like why can't I keep it together like everyone Mm. else I would be taking my children to birthday parties getting lost on the way there and then ending up having meltdowns because I couldn't find out where I was going and we were going to be late and and not knowing why you know I imagine it it could could sort of produce a lot of thoughts in your brain and like am I am I crazy like is this a seizure that I'm having or like yeah or am I just like a really bad person or you know yeah I just didn't know why and I also would end up getting so like I ended up not being able to access mental health services because I'd had a meltdown and they decided that that was like unacceptable behavior so they wouldn't work with me anymore really you know like stuff like that happens really yeah. that, that happens yeah oh, that happens Jesus it really Christ. really does yeah, this is why I'm so keen to work in mental health mm. services these days. Um, so yeah, that was really hard. Um, and then um, getting that diagnosis, you know, after my eldest child was diagnosed, I thought when I when I realized I was autistic, but before I'd been assessed and been diagnosed, yeah. it was a bit of a re- relief. And like, I think often late diagnosed autistics, when you first have that realization, it becomes this like obsession, like all I could think about, talk about, was autism and whether I might be autistic and it was like almost like a new fun special interest um and then I got the actual diagnosis and I thought I was going to be thrilled and actually I wasn't I felt I think 
I felt, I think part of me before I got the diagnosis thought I'd made the whole thing up in my head and I was going to see a doctor and they were going to be like, what? Go away. Um, and when they were like, they, they were like, this is really an easy diagnosis. I was like, oh my goodness. And not only am I autistic, but apparently I'm quite obviously autistic. Um, so yeah, there was like this, like, well, this isn't fair. I'm 36. Like all these things I've failed at university. I've failed at this. I've got no career. All these things that I could have had and could have done has been taken away from me because I wasn't born 20 years later when somebody yeah. would have noticed I was autistic at, you know, your age or, mm -hmm. or what, at 10 or whatever. So I went through a bit of a period of both grief and disbelief, like grief uh, of what I've said and disbelief of like, um, maybe they were wrong. Maybe I'm just really good at, I'm quite convincing. Maybe I just convinced them that I'm autistic somehow by being really like convincing. Um, or like, I think it's weird, isn't it? When you get a diagnosis that isn't based on like a blood test or whatever, and it's like someone's opinion based on things it's that they've exactly. seen. Exactly. It's, it's, it's a really weird thing, autism and, and how it's, cause it's, it's basically, it's all about behavior, isn't it? So it's like, you know, it, it really stands out to me, um, as, as a, as a misconception that people have about like, oh, I'm a little bit autistic because I have, um, some, some behaviors that are related to an autism diagnosis. And, you know, quite often it's, you know, th these, this diagnostic procedure is, is meant to only pick up on signs that you may be autistic. Um, not not give you autism like <laughs> when you get, <laughs> when you get diagnosed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's really complex like idea to kind of wrap your head around. I think. Yeah, it really is. So like wrapping my head around that and also believing that, I would say, took like a good three or four years. It was quite wow. a process. And during this time, I'm like speaking at NAS conferences and putting out stuff on the internet. Um, so yeah, but it it has in the long term, it's been the start of a process which is which has enabled me to feel better about who I am. It's enabled me to obviously develop a career that I'm proud of. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's enabled me to be a better mother to my autistic children because I have that understanding of who I am and therefore the experiences they're likely to have, I guess. Um, and I think, yeah, it's not an excuse for bad behavior. I would never say that, but I think it's kind of helped me to understand why I've made some of the mistakes that I've made and how I need my life to look and how I need what needs I have in order to bring out my strengths and be the best yeah. and, the, and the happiest that I can be. So it's, it's, it's a bunch of like, there's a lot of sort of steps after you get a diagnosis, like diagnosis is just confirmation that, <laughs> that, that you're autistic and like, there's, there's lots of different things that you have to work on as, you know, like, like I said before about sort of only really, getting into what autism was past the sensory social issues in my 20s it definitely took me probably about i mean to be honest I, f I still feel like i'm still learning about it and learning about myself but it did take me a long time and the, there was a lot of barriers like mental barriers that i had to kind of overcome in order to kind of conceptualize what what autism meant to me and how it how it influenced uh, the the different perceptions that I have of other people all of that kind of stuff and processing trauma was was like a, a massive part you know yeah I think that's a really big one and it's one that I've become really interested in lately actually is the fact that so many autistic people are also traumatized people mm. and what that means for us in terms of how we cope with relationships and how we feel about ourselves and so, yeah, trauma's been, trauma's been my, like, the last six months, trauma's been my obsession. If you look at my content in the last six months, <laughs> probably say trauma more times than I did in the entire six years prior to yeah. that. Um, because I'm, I'm realizing things like, you know, when I feel deeply rejected by someone doing something relatively minor, mm. I'm actually feeling deeply rejected by all the rejection that I've experienced in my lifetime and that that's just triggering that feeling, you know? I am fired with that. Yeah, it's a really useful thing. And then there's even the small stuff since since getting my diagnosis. Like when I before I was diagnosed, I dressed how the other mums around me dressed because I felt <laughs> like that's what I was supposed to do. And when I was diagnosed, I I like re wore what I wanted to wear, did what I wanted to do, you know, like stopped defining myself by trying to be someone else essentially. Mm. So I stopped like 
doing things like going out for coffee, you know, because I, I don't want to sit in a cafe and chat to someone. It was just it, what you did. They're did, usually like right? really noisy as well, aren't they, with the, the coffee grinders and stuff. And Yeah. You know, you, I'd much rather meet someone for a board game. Or, yes, you know. I, I definitely agree with you. Um, most coffee shops I don't go to, but there's this one coffee shop, um, it's like uh, under the, it's, it's Cafe Nero, but it's like, it's got like two floors to it. And one is like the, the, the base floor where most people kind of go and chat to each other. And it's always the noisiest, but then upstairs you have this like whole open sort of rustic appeal kind of place with loads of really comfy sofas and like a window that you can, you can people watch through and, oh, it's, um, it's a lovely place for me to go to. I like to, to go there when I'm like writing and stuff. Yeah, I quite like a cafe on my own. I think one of the big realisations for me was, like, so I think one of the things that I did to cope with being an undiagnosed autistic was become a performer. Mm. Like, if nobody will like me generally, at least when I'm on stage, people will clap. You know, it sounds really pathetic when I say it like that, no, but I guess it was that, like, need for acceptance, it's, right? It's really, really open of you to, to say that because it's, you know, it's not an easy thing to say that you, you know, you, you find that you, you pick up on small small changes in you, you hyper focusing on on people's body language and facial expressions and differences and and then something's different in your mood and i can <laughs> sense it and i need to Please know what it me. is so yeah so at that time and up until kind of up until the pandemic probably i was always surrounded by people i always had lots of friends i always had lots of people over to lots of socializing i've come to realize i don't really like it that much i quite like being on my own and that's actually okay because honestly, I think my story is one of what is it to mask nearly 24 seven for nearly 40 years and what impact does that have on your mental health and your well being? And I can tell you it's very negative. Wow. And what I'm having to do right now is pull back from that and find spaces where I can be on my own because that's when I'm most likely to unmask because I find it really, really hard to unmask. Um, in order to heal my body and my mind as a result of all that extra adrenaline and all that extra trauma that I've been dealing with mm. over those years. Well, thank you for sharing that. Sorry, that got heavy quick, didn't no, it? No, no, no. We're, we're, we're all about heavy over here. Like, <laughs> Oh, that's good. I'm your girl. Heavy, heaviness <laughs> I mean, is, not your girl. <laughs> heaviness is, um, it's, it's, it's an integral part of the podcast, so don't, don't worry about it. So the second question that I have, for you is for some people you know get, getting diagnosed is a massive step of of courage you know you've got all that stigma around the label and you've got this this identity that you've built up over the years and you know autism comes along and you it kind of puts that into question and it's, it's quite a scary thing and it, it seems that to me there are some shared steps that aut autistic people take like we talked about with the process, processing trauma. So in your autism journey, do you have times or situations that really stood out as being transformative for your life? Yeah, I would say I would say so. I would say the first one was like when I first got the diagnosis, and I think the biggest change at that point was the was the decision to find out who I really was. So I didn't know who I was. I wasn't necessarily unmasked or, or in any way healed, but it was the point at which I went, I'm throwing out everything that I've been doing in order to fit in out of the window and I'm going to figure out what I want my life to look mm -hmm. like. And And that was a point at which I kind of actually got a lot of new friends around that time because because I was talking openly about autism people who had like got children that were autistic yeah. or whatever in my social world but that weren't necessarily close to me were coming to me and sure. becoming a part of my world in a way that meant it was about my autism which was what I needed at that time I think to feel safe yeah so that was really useful and then I would say the next kind of big step I would say is was the pandemic and the, and the subsequent lock, lockdown I think that was really really massive for me I think before that I was looking at autism in a more like step-by-step -step way like mm. so I'm autistic so that must mean that I need to wear ear defenders and I probably ought to be into comic books right I was almost <laughs> like almost like Matt trying to mask an autistic <laughs> yeah. person 
like <laughs> what do I do to fit in here then I think especially because at that oh time particularly and I'm going to be really honest <laughs> there were a lot of content creators around and I never felt part of that world no. because I wasn't young yeah. and I wasn't male um and so I was like yeah trying to trying to put that on <laughs> how do I be Sheldon is that what I'm doing yes. now <laughs> and then the pandemic happened and I like reached out to my community really as my way of coping and said you know by which I mean you know primarily my youtube subscriber base uh, which was like quite a relatively low number i think i've got like five or six thousand subscribers at that point and i kind of went i'm gonna do a weekly live stream and i'm just gonna be here that's how many subscribers i have (laughs) oh oh, gosh i'm so sorry it's okay (laughs) i just (laughs) mean like but but i I know what you mean it's i I, i'm i was just making a, a joke for humor's sake. But you're like an Olympian, so you never have to feel bad about yourself, right? Like if I'd got an Olympic medal, I'd just be like, I'd be holding it right now if I were you and, and like and like rubbing. Have you got an actual, you've got a medal, right? Uh, it's not an Olympic medal, it's a Commonwealth. Um, I mean, that's still pretty amazing. Do you want to see it? So, yeah, I want to see your medal. I'll go grab it. There you go. Oh. Wow. Is it gold? Did you get gold? I did. I did get a gold. Wow. That's amazing. Well done. Oh, thank you. That's, that's really impressive. <laughs> M- way more impressive than a bunch of YouTube subscribers, for sure. Anyway, have I, have I dug myself out of that Yeah, you've d- I think you've on? sufficiently dug yourself out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So I started doing these weekly live streams and I spent, and at the same time, I guess, like everyone else, was spending a lot of time on my own without having to, like, dress up for the world, sure. if you know what I mean. Mm. And that was a really transformative time for me because I kind of was, I was given a chance to sit with myself, I guess, in a way that you're not in the regular world because you're busy with work and children and life. And I was given a chance to really, really think about who I am. And then I think being given this like responsibility of this community of people that came around me because of doing these live streams and they were all listening to me. So I was like, well, you know, I probably ought to be saying and doing sensible things if I'm inspiring other people sure. um and that really gave me like partly gave me a confidence like oh gosh I'm actually useful you know something about me is useful people are appreciating me and it gave me the chance to really like come out is the word that I would use mm. even though it's not about sexuality or gender but come out as like I don't need to perform anymore I don't need like I'm enough as I am kind of thing so that that I'd say that period of lockdown, particularly the first lockdown, but you know, the period since then was the point at which I have become more holistic and whatever in my approach to autism, less like, less like here's a bunch of facts about autism that I want to tell you and more like here, here's how it actually feels and here's what it Mm. actually means that we all carry. I don't know whether that's making sense. No, no, I I get what you mean. It's like, um, it's like, it's like a shift from fact based content to more of a have having more of the experiential aspects to it. Is that is that Yeah, and then taking and then taking that and running with it in like what can I do for my community and for myself? And then I also did some therapy. i I'm seeing a therapist now. Um and for the first time I'm seeing a therapist who specializes in working with autistic people oh, and people with ADHD. I need, I need so one that's of those. been really helpful. <laughs> I need one of those. Yeah, it's been very helpful. That's been really, really helpful. <laughs> so I think I think I'm optimistic. I hope that in five years' time I'm gonna look back on this period and say, This is the period of time in which of time in which I healed myself. So I it's hope. like a new a new, a new adolescence, isn't it? Is um finding your place yeah. in the world and your identity and yeah, I do. F- yeah, I do think definitely. that you, you're right in saying coming out about it because it's it's coming out with your you, you're coming out as in as you rather than a mask, you know. Um, it's quite and also not not like looking for external. I think you know if you're on social media making content, whether you want to admit to it or not, to some extent you're looking for external <laughs> validation, aren't you? <laughs> like right. Um, and and I certainly definitely was in the early days. And I think in the last year, I've reached the point where I'm genuinely not. I am genuinely not. When I put out content, I'm not like, how's this going to be received? I'm like, what do I actually have to say that is of value? And how do I want to do it? And screw however many views it gets or whatever. Sure. And that feels like a really healthy place to be in. Sure. No, I I, I completely agree with you with that. It's, 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 easy, it's easy to 
because because it's such a um a personal thing and it's it's very di- autism is very different person to person it can sometimes feel like am i am i telling people about what autism is or am i telling people about me or t- you know telling me about my experience of being autistic or so i i often have that sort of mental barrier in my head that i'm like should i really be talking about this is this something that that everyone experiences or am i just you know just talking about me so um, i feel like i, I want to get to the point do you ever feel like this i feel like i almost don't want to put autism as a label in the conversation <laughs> i feel like i almost just want to be going this is what i'm experiencing anyone else yeah. you know? <laughs> i get that so one of one of the things that is is a very big topic and has been for a while is unmasking how do you how do you unmask what 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 is the process of of unmasking yeah i mean that's another huge question isn't it because uh i think my answer would have been different on every year that you asked me <laughs> but this year the answer is for me personally uh learning to stim has been a big part of unmasking because Lovely. as a child i definitely stimmed i remember stimming i remember i remember walking around supermarkets doing stuff with my arms and my mom being like <laughs> stop it at like the age of like 13 we're not talking small child you know yeah, yeah. And I definitely learn not to stim. And then what's been beautiful, and I think where I'm fortunate in having autistic children who I have never, ever encouraged to mask or uh, or not stim, sure. is watching them stim and see how that benefits them. And then I started to stim with particularly my youngest child because oh, she doesn't go to school. So we so spend cute. a lot of time together. Oh, um, and yeah, and she that. has some really cute stims that are quite reminiscent of the ones that I had when I was little. <sighs> That's yeah. such a so beautiful learning to stim. thing. Stimming, stimming with your autistic child. With your so. child. There's actually a TikTok video of us stimming. It oh. might even be on Instagram of us stimming oh. together, and I do love it. I watch it. It makes me smile every time I watch it because she doesn't look like I've gone, oh, stim for camera. Yeah. She just looks like she's in heaven, and I've managed <laughs> to capture it, and that's beautiful. Um, so learning to stim, and I think the first time I realised I was in a difficult situation in the world, something had happened, and I was stimming and I hadn't noticed I was doing it, yeah. you know, and I was like, oh, okay, that's good. I've actually reclaimed that. Brilliant. That's been a big part of it because I think stimming is such an important part of how we regulate that when you're sure. not stimming in public, that's a big part of that mask, isn't mm. it? Um, and then I think the next part of it for me has been turning off the entertainer, like, because I am an, I'm a born entertainer. I do love it, but like, I don't. Like it's not normal to be entertaining while sitting around the dinner table or making breakfast or, you know, like in regular life. Yeah. And I think I'd reached the point where, because I've always been like that, because that's part of my mask, I felt like people expected that from me because it was what people liked about me, that I'm funny, that I'm entertaining. And like, if I don't do that, will people still like me? And so I'm really like in the very, very early stages of trying to do that. And I can really only do it around my my family and my very, very closest friends. Course, but like yeah. just losing the face and, lo- you know, like all of this, it's an act. It's all an act. Underneath that, I'm quite dull, really. Um, and then the <laughs> I wouldn't final say thing, that. I mean, I would not yeah, say maybe. that. It's it's just it's an exaggeration of your personality, and it's just right, what you have exactly. to do when you when you're on the internet. Um, and then the other thing I would say that I've done that's been really important, that I think would be useful for other people, is I have made like I've journaled and I've made art around. Uh, how do I see myself physically? How do I perceive myself? What do I genuinely love as opposed to what have I been saying that I love because I felt like I was supposed to love it? Um, Like even stupid stuff, like I absolutely do love Doctor Who with all of my heart and all of my soul. You know, there's no lie there. So like really figuring out what are those things that make up my life, that make me happy, that are who I am. And then finally working out what my values are. Because I think when we mask, it's not just the mask of how do we actually present ourselves in the world. It's also the mask of what do we say we believe politically? Mm. What do we say we love in order to feel like we're fitting mm. in with everybody else, you know? Um, and so kind of like I actually made a value statement. What are my values? What is important to me? Who do I want to be in the world? Oh, and that's, so that's what I've been doing. And it's really, really been very helpful. I would definitely recommend it. That is a really great point. Like honestly like um i i got really excited when you were talking about values and meaning because it's it's um it's something that i i've looked in I looked into a lot um 
especially around like coping with mental health and things like that. And I do, I do think you're right. I, I think that, you know, we, we actively try and, you know, when we're in that, that state of trying to fit in and be a part of the world and be successful. And we do take on board other people, you know, people that we see and are like, Oh, I want to be like this person, you know, what, what do they value and what do they, you know, and it's, it's sometimes really, really positive to kind of sit down and go, what do, what do I actually value? Like what brings me meaning in my life and joy and, Things, things that I would actually make, so. highly recommend I'm just thinking as you're saying that I'm thinking you know how like we've, we're living in like extremely woke times <laughs> and cancel culture and all that yeah. you know how like neurotypical people are all like oh my god it feels like you can't speak freely anymore are they like experiencing autistic masking <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe <laughs> like that they've got to be a certain way or they're going to get cancelled because that is exactly how we felt right yeah oh I'm going to make a video about that that's it's, a whole topic <laughs> there isn't it that's a juicy um, topic <laughs> yeah yeah so i'd also really recommend i've been doing st- uh stoic journal i don't know whether you know about stoicism. I love stoicism yeah so i've been doing like a daily stoic journal since the start of the year and that's a lot about that as well figuring out what your values are what's important to you and, and i found that really helpful one, one of the other things that i was interested in so we, we talked to talked about unmasking and like processing trauma and stuff did you did you at all in your journey go go through a stage of denial or aversion to 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 go in and get in a diagnosis? No, I didn't know because I think because I'd already processed maybe because my child was diagnosed ahead of me, you know, only months ahead of me, only about four or five months ahead of me, but because I maybe went through that with them, hmm. maybe I'd already done that, yeah. like by proxy, yeah. if you like. Like, should I be doing this? Should I be labeling them? Should I, what does this mean? Mm-hmm. I think because I'd like firmly concluded in my mind that all that we were talking about was a descriptor, Yeah, you know, that it was, that it was okay. But my child, they went through, my eldest went through it. I don't think I'm autistic actually, after all, <laughs> phase, which was fun. Well, it's, it's, it's a weird thing, autism and teenagers, because uh, you don't want to hear anything that your parents are talking about uh, to do with you and who you are, because you're kind of in that stage where you're trying to break off and like trying to assert some some level of independence. And, you know, I, I definitely, I, I'm not ashamed to say that I definitely did that when I was younger <laughs> around mental health. I think health I would and, say my... My middle child is doing that. My middle child is 13 and they're definitely doing what you're describing. My eldest, I don't think it's been like that, but that's perhaps because because she's trans and because she's autistic sure. and because I've been the main support in that. We are really, really close and, and I don't feel like there is that resistance. So maybe that's one of the silver linings sure. to her challenge, her life struggles. Cool. So, I mean, not 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 cool about the life struggles. I know, so. I know what you meant. I know what you meant. <laughs> Sorry, right, I won't cancel you. If you don't cancel me, I won't cancel you. <laughs> so what I want to ask you next is, what are some common misconceptions or comments you've received about your late diagnosis by people either in your eye, in your life or online? I think I would say, I think I've been, from what I've heard from other people, I think I've been quite fortunate in that most of the people in my actual life either embrace the fact that I am autistic and what that means for our relationship moving forward, or at least pretended to do so. Mm -hmm. So I didn't receive any like negative feedback or any judgment from the people in like in my real life and my in my non-online life and even online compared to what some I know some people have gone through on the whole I don't deal with too much discourse but of course of course I get the comments that I'm not really autistic and that I'm high functioning and that I'm somehow just doing this for money I'd really like to know where the money for being autistic comes from because if you had it yet did you get sent the payment I didn't. um <laughs> that I'm doing it for money that I'm taking resources that other people shouldn't take you know yeah like a little bit but it's been quite minimal minimal I feel like I've been quite fortunate and I've always had this approach as well yeah of just deleting it yeah so I just I, I I sort of decided quite early on in my YouTube career that I was not going to let these idiots get to me, sure. um, or or impact how I felt, and that the second a con a comment was 
negative or bullying not negative like someone can disagree with me yeah in a respectful yeah. way as soon as it crossed the line into being disrespectful or bullying or unacceptable behavior i would just delete it straight yeah. away so now i've become quite good at just and it almost satisfies me like i got a comment recently that was like three full paragraphs on why i'm not autistic three full paragraphs a good 600 words yeah oh on gosh. why i'm not really autistic and when i deleted it it was like almost joyful like oh my god you must have spent so long writing this mean comment it's gonna really annoy you but it's just gone you know I get that. um but i just don't i think like i've kind of decided that other people's opinions are none of my business of me are none of my business and that i can't be concerned with them so i really just genuinely don't give it a huge amount of thought you know I recently had some massive backlash and a lot of really negative comments about my gender identity mm -hmm. and I know we're not here to talk about that today but it was very very harsh and people said some very very unkind things about me um including that I am not fit to be a mother which is the kind of one of what? the biggest insults you can give to a parent yeah it yeah, just yeah. doesn't I'm, make any I'm, sense you know, what? <laughs> because I'm non-binary and because I talk about it on the internet I'm essentially grooming teenagers what? apparently <laughs> Yeah, I know. Um, and that that was hard, but it taught me a really important lesson in that no matter what I do, no matter what I say, there are going to be people in the world who don't like me or don't believe my experience for whatever reason they have for doing mm. so. And that if I give them any power or any space in my head, then they're winning and I won't let them win. So I won't let them in. Very well said. I've, de I've definitely had my, my first fair share of um negative comments <laughs> in the past really as you as you can probably tell from from my name i uh i tend to get a lot of um you're a you're a eugenics eugenicist and a nazi and you know like things like that i'm, I'm not making the link why would your name that's because i use asperger's growth Oh, the Aspie thing. Yeah, but, 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 and I would ask you, I've got two questions for you. I know it's your podcast, but <laughs> Go I decided for it. I'm hosting just for a minute. Um, firstly, would you be using that name if you were to name it now? Um, I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm, I'm not like, I don't have an agenda. I'm just curious. I think, I think it definitely ser served me well, you know, to, to have that name. I think the, the only issue that I have with, my name is that I don't like it. I don't like how it sounds. It's, it just doesn't seem like a very um, punchy kind of title. You know, I can't just say to someone, like, if, uh, if I'm doing some networking, like, Asperger's Growth, and they'll be like, oh, how do I spell that? And, like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, I get that. I mean, my name doesn't even connect me to autism, <laughs> so I'm not sure I did, did a great job of naming things. Sure. Um, and would you say that, I actually have three questions as it turns out. Would it. you Go say that your di were you diagnosed with Asperger's? I was. Is that what your diagnosis it's still was? On my, still on my records. So it hasn't been changed. So personally, although I don't tend to use the word Asperger's because of its links mm. to Hans Asperger, I would always caveat that with if that is what you were diagnosed with and identified as as a very young child, right? And that feels like a part of your identity, I would never, I would never say sure. you shouldn't use that word because it, it is connected with him but it is also something that's connected with you now because you've carried it for so long right well i mean so that makes sense to me you know the, we, we can always we can always deba debate language and uh, i i've made i've made many posts in the past which is along the lines of like it's it's okay to have to have an opinion on on using it but when someone's ref if someone goes out and says like everyone should use asperger's you should just use it like why are you not using it then i i would have an issue with that i think if it was if it was just me saying look this is this is why i use asperger's and you know someone else was like oh this is this is why i call myself autistic and like i wouldn't have any 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 issues with that because it's just a personal preference i think the problem is is that it's celebrating so like an interesting parallel i guess would be i don't know whether you know but i'm in bristol where the colston statue got taken down during the black lives matter march did you, did you hear not, about that i did not know about so that. colston was a slave trader who built a lot of bristol 
And during the Black Lives Matter march, they took down a prominent statue of him in the center of the city and they stuck it in the river. And we all cheered and I cheered and I fully stand by that. And in the time since then, a lot of things that were named after Colston, like Colston Hall and Colston Girls School, have been renamed. Mm -hmm. Because essentially in using that name, what we were doing was celebrating a slave trader and giving his name an integral part of our Mm -hmm. city. Yeah. And so I suppose there are some parallels between that and the word Asperger's in that I don't actually know a huge amount about it, but my understanding is that Hans Asperger was a Nazi sympathizer. Mm -hmm. But that is just my understanding of the situation. So I suppose that when we use Asperger's as as a term that gets used widely, we are like keeping alive the name of someone who potentially wasn't a good person. I guess that's why people might have an issue yeah. with it. <laughs> I, I completely that get that. That said, if I'd named my channel in 2016 something, I might have included the word Asperger's because at that time I didn't know that. Yeah. And and I might feel that it's difficult for me to rebrand something that I've been known as for a really long time. Although Aspen Princess Chloe Hayden did recently do just that, which I thought was quite interesting. It's it's funny um, that you say that because I am, I'm wanting to rebrand at the moment firstly because i don't like asperger's growth the name i just it doesn't Mm -hmm. roll off the tongue for me and um another one is i don't want it to stop people from reading my stuff or listening to me or you know and if if i can it's it's i i can deal with like the the hate from it and i can deal with the method the the hateful messages and things of that nature but why do people have to deal with it like that? Why can't they just be like, I don't love your name, but great content? Yeah, something, oh, right? well, exactly. I, and I would be fine with that. It's it's just, it's 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 immediately they put me into a box because they're, they're like, oh, here's a male. He he looks like he goes to the gym. He must be a straight, straight white cis, cis male. And um, all of that. And then I immediately got all of these different labels that – Quite frankly, most of them don't, don't, other than cis male and white, like they don't apply to me, but I just get put in the, in the box um, because I don't. Yeah, of, that must be really hard. I don't sort of uh, lend myself to the, the popular idea that I should not use Asperger's, but it's. I think that's the problem, though. I think we do really live in, like, mob mentality at the moment, don't we? Like, mm. I don't know about you, but I'm terrified of saying the wrong <laughs> thing on the internet uh, these days in a way that I wasn't when we first started. Yeah. That, you know, it's, you've been around for a while yeah, as well, haven't you? Political. It's like, it's, um... I haven't yet said the wrong thing on the internet, to my knowledge, but I am someone who just says what I think, so it could very easily happen. And it, like, doesn't give anybody any room for growth mm. or learning because it's like... If I'm scared to say anything, if I'm silenced by the fear of saying the wrong thing, or if I'm silenced by having conversations in which I would learn, how do I learn? How do I grow? I, f- I find it really worrying. It's like pick a side and hunker down, isn't it, at the moment? And I don't love that. No, I, I'm very, I'm very firmly on on no side. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me so, too. <laughs> but I, Switzerland. I just, just I, I keep a little bit of an eye on you know how things may be may be perceived, but. Like I, it just it inhibits my ability to create content because I'm like, oh, I did, did I say this? Or and then I start questioning myself, and then after a while, like I've been silent for like five seconds, and I'm, you know, how do I speak about this? <laughs> I think there's a really good book by Brené Brown. Have you come across Brené Brown? Brené Brown. She's awesome. So she speaks about what does she speak about? I mean, just like personal development stuff, really. And she's written this book called uh, Into the Wilderness, Braving the Wilderness, Braving the Wilderness that I read at some point during the pandemic. Mm. And it talks about this, like being vulnerable and holding your truth, even in a world where you could get cancelled for it. And one of the things that really struck me in that book was she was talking about, look, you might be a left wing, you know, uh, you might be left wing, you might be like really opposed to voting conservative. Sure. You might have a neighbour who is like a massive Tory supporter, but also this neighbour, when you were unwell, brought you food. Mm. And when you needed a lift somewhere, gave you that lift. And if we stop having... So yes, I wouldn't personally use Asperger's in my work these days, but I'm not going to let that stop me from potentially building a relationship with like you, 
who I've only just met in terms of like networking and knowing someone sure. because you use that in your name because it is one facet of who you are and we are never going to find what do we want to do live in a world where everyone is exactly <laughs> like us with exactly the same opinions that sounds really dull to me oh I love that well, thank you, thank you for the questions. I, I actually really enjoy taking questions. That's like cool. it's the main thing that I do outside outside the um the podcast. Go on, go on other people's stuff. Oh, cool. <laughs> so I've got one more question, and then we'll we'll mm-hmm. do a couple of uh, interview questions from from Instagram at Asperger's Grove. Cool. Any anybody who's listening, if you want to ask a question, what advice? would you give to people who are considering a diagnosis but are hesitant to commit for various reasons? I would say, in reality, I would always want to caveat anything that I say around this, that we don't live in a world where the diagnostic procedure is really perfect. We don't live in a world where the referral process Mm. is perfect. So there are people going for assessment who are autistic but are not receiving that diagnosis because of gender biases or race biases, you know? That's that's a fact, yeah. and I think we need to say that if we ever speak about access and diagnosis. But if you want to go for it anyway and give it a try, keep that in mind. Don't let the experience invalidate your experience. I would say my uh, first piece of advice would be like practical stuff, like make a list of the reasons you think you might be autistic to take with you to the GP so that you have that to reference or even give to them if you find yourself a little bit tongue-tied. Sure. Don't take no for an answer. They might say you don't need an assessment, you're fine, you've got a job, whatever. Don't take no for an answer. You have a right to be referred for an autism assessment. Use that right. Kind of like I would say throughout that diagnostic process, learning to be your own best advocate and not feeling bad about that is really important. Mm. Learning to guard your boundaries and know what you have a right to so that you can confidently say, I did everything that I could to support myself to access this assessment. Um, And outside of that, I would say give yourself time to process what you're experiencing and what you're learning about yourself and look after yourself like you would your very best friend because this is heavy stuff it's life-changing stuff and you're going to need to eat a lot of cake and and watch a lot of your favorite tv show in order to kind of like regulate and cope with that experience brilliant thank you ella i think i think in in my mind i i when when someone would say that you know the the hesitant to go for a diagnosis. I think about my dad, and I think about pe- people in my life who are quite obviously autistic. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I I know it's it you know it's 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 a thing to say that you know like I'm pretty sure that someone's autistic without having diagnosed them or, or anything like that. But it's just very apparent sometimes, and um. I, I was talking to this this man called Peter Bainbridge as part of my documentary Asperger's in Society, and he he mediates between autistic people and like the law or like housing accommodation thing, things of that nature, or, or within families. And the thing that he said is that most most autistic people will go f- go through their life sort of trying to ignore that that part of them up until the point where they need to pay attention to it and you know some sometimes that's at the point where they've experienced like a really negative um bad life experience or, or trauma you know f- for me a part of that was um being lonely at university and not not knowing how to to make friends and and recently broken up with my long-term partner you know, I was, I was quite in a, in a place of quite heavy isolation, and that's that's what encouraged me to start my YouTube channel and try and try and learn more about autism and try and verbally process it myself. Do you think there's any way to get around that for people? Like, do you do you think that we could change something about society or about the processes or the way that people view autism that would make it easier? for for people to you know not not feel such an aversion to to getting diagnosed I suppose. there's a very long question um, <laughs> yeah i'm just processing it i'm just not masking and giving myself yeah. time to process it rather than just blurting out whatever comes into my head first um yeah i would say that 
the more to first one of the things I think that's really helpful is the more kind of high profile people that get diagnosed with autism talk about it so like I'm talking about people like Anthony Hopkins mm. right I love the fact that Anthony Hopkins what was he in his 70s when he was diagnosed wow um and so, you know, people, because of the age that I am, uh, I get a lot of audience, you know, in their 50s and their 60s even. And many of them are saying, oh, is it too late? Is it too late to do this? Do I need to do this? Oh, hang on. I just need to let my dog in. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Are we going to be able to see Coco? Come on, Stinks. Come on. Then. Oh, come on, you silly girl. Here she is. Hello. Hi, Coco. <laughs> oh, she's... Um, uh, is, is she, she's cute she, right she, oh, yeah, yeah okay. she's a girl yeah she's yeah. beautiful um so like i always sort of cite it's great to have people like people in the public eye are really useful when i'm reassuring people about getting diagnosis because sure. i could say well look anthony hopkins obviously felt it was worth doing in his 70s mm-hmm. so you know that means that it's it's worth doing for anyone and i think like just changing the stereotypes around autism generally, like this idea that we're all cold and unfeeling and difficult to be around and that all autistic people are the same and that we're all really mathsy, like just dispelling as many of those like myths and stereotypes yeah. until we reach a point where it's recognized that autistic people and, you know, people with all the like common comorbidities like ADHD and dyslexia and dyspraxia are essentially just human beings with brains that work differently but that that looks different on every single personality and if we just start if we reach the point of starting to just see that as like in a more normal just a part of our world a part of our culture then it won't be so scary to identify as that and people will be less scared to like go and access the diagnosis but i think i think honestly the main reason people are scared to go forward for diagnosis at this point is the fact that they know they'll be waiting a really long time and they'll likely <laughs> yeah. be told that they're not autistic so i think diagnostic services need to improve and in that i think that we're doing it completely wrong anyway this is just my like non-professional opinion but like why are we diagnosing autism at this clinic and adhd over here and dyslexia over there you know like i mean do you have any comorbidities is are there there, are, there aren't that many autistic I, people I have who don't have an add-on many, many. I've got dyslexia and ADHD and anxiety, you know, so like I really feel like it would be more useful at this point to be going, right, what is your neurodivergent profile? What are your strengths? What support needs do you have that enable you to like really reach Mm. those strengths and be the happiest that you can be? And just to like be getting information about that in one place rather than put trying to almost put us in these separate boxes. Farriers about. Does that make any sense? the course of months a long time and cost probably costing more money than if we did it all in one place Indeed. And looked at it more holistically right yeah no I, I i completely i completely understand that like i think it's it's really worth you know considering the this the sort of stigma around being autistic as like it's not only that a lot of people think it's a negative thing just fully just completely negative thing it's also that I just, I just don't think there's, there's enough representation of, you know, the, the, the whole, the whole spectrum, you know, like a lot of different autistic people's voices. It just seems to be a very, so it seems to be in the, in the media that any stories that are around autism are always about triumphing despite, despite your condition or <laughs> despite being autistic rather than or like being some kind of a genius like the good doctor yeah. right where you've got a mind palace and sure. all these... those those kind of but don't you think that's true of like representation generally yeah so i've been watching heartstopper have you watched heartstopper the big netflix you know i'm not. way too old to be watching heartstopper i watched it with my kids and it's basically a great show with lgbtq plus representation brilliant brilliant Lovely. but what i'd like to see moving forwards with all minority groups and representation in media is for their minority statuses to just be not the entire focus yes. or not to be like this yes. is a show about an autistic gay person yes. that's really focus on their gayness <laughs> and their autism and they've got no other personality that's their whole personality you know indeed like if we were just yeah. incidentally in shows you know with a disclosed diagnosis i think that is a useful thing because otherwise we get the sheldon situation where it's like well we can make a whole show where we mock an autistic person because we never actually said he was <laughs> autistic you know but like if we can have like out autistic pe- characters in shows 
but that it's not the show about the autistic person. And they're just like, so if if we're one in, what's the stats? One in ten? One in what? How many of us are there? Have you, do you know? I think it's uh, increased to like one in fifty or some something like so that. So if we're like one in fifty, right? In every show where there's fifty characters, one of them should be autistic. Yeah. You know. I feel. So, yeah. I, I do agree with you. It just it's just always the highlight. It's always the reason why the mainstream media takes on board a story. It's like, oh, they're they're disabled, they're autistic, or something, and so we'll get them on, and you know, it'll make their achievements seem even more better because you know, it's they've got that awe factor, you know, the yeah, like the the disability hero, the yeah. disability porn kind of thing that I can't remember. <laughs> I always like porn. to cite the lady, the inspiration porn. Do you know what the lady was that that talked about that? Because I never like to talk about something without crediting the person. Maybe you could put it in the show notes. Go for it. I've um, got a growing list of tabs on my computer with um, but basically her whole thing her, stella young i'm gonna say stella young stella but young. i could be wrong um and she talked about how like it's much more comfortable to be around disabled people if they are inspirational so it's like oh my god you got dressed how did you do that that's so amazing <laughs> and it's like we don't want to be your inspiration we don't want to have magical gifts we don't want to have superpowers we just people who have brains that work a little bit differently to the majority. Sure. And 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 I think when we get rid of that narrative, that will be really useful as well. Like that, like you're so amazing because you aren't curled up in a ball crying about your terrible brain, you know? The the listeners cannot see, but I am squinching my face like that. <laughs> um, well, um that's that's the end of the the main sort of body of questions we've got a couple from instagram how did you get instagram questions did you ask them yes yeah yeah you ask on like a a story i did it did it early in the week and people did actually want to ask me things they do not that i'm looking for external validation because <laughs> i'm totally not <laughs> no i i'm sure i'm sure many people would would love to ask you a any any number of questions because you do you do some amazing work on online like you do oh thank you um so i've got the first one is what to do about the cost of getting a diagnosis and the wait times what can i do in the meantime of waiting what to do in the meantime yeah. while you're waiting i would say um that it is totally okay to treat yourself as if you are autistic while you are waiting to access an assessment whatever the barriers that might be and to learn from your own experience, from advocates, from wherever you want to learn about autism, about things that might support you as an autistic person and to implement them and to see that they, if they improve your life because they're certainly not going to make your life worse. And even if at the end of the day you weren't diagnosed with autism for whatever reason, if the strategies and the things you're doing to support yourself are helping, they would still be valid. So it's, it's still a useful thing sure. to do. Um, and I would also use that time to like learn about myself and to learn about autism. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that you don't need a doctor to tick a box to say you're allowed to look after yourself better now and sure. that you're allowed to love yourself and that you la you're allowed to feel valid presenting in to the world in the way that you feel that you do. Sure. I don't think there's anything that I can add on to that one. <laughs> you, you pretty much said it all, I think. Uh, so I've got the second one here, which is, how do I get my partner to get a diagnosis? Ooh, I mean, do they want to access an assessment? I guess that's asking, how do I persuade another person to want mm. to find out something about themselves that I think is true, but maybe they don't? Yeah, I, I get a lot of messages because I, I make a lot of stuff around relationships and dating and things. And yeah, I've had this question from, before neurotypical people asking about you know their partner like getting their diagnosis and you know the bit being some negative things to, to not knowing how they function and stuff like that but yeah well interestingly I've got a little aside <laughs> for you in that my husband when I was first diagnosed went to a group for parents parents partners of autistic people a support group and he only went twice because he was like I don't want to go and sit in a room and moan about you for <laughs> yeah. two hours that seemed to be the main kind of motivation for the group and he was just oh, like I don't really feel like it's that it's true I've I've seen the Facebook groups that I've I've yeah. I've infiltrated the partners of autistic people 
Um, Ooh, have you? Groups, what do they say about um, us? It's a lot of complaining. Um, okay. And it's a lot cool. of, like, talking about how they don't have any emotions and oh, or any So can we set up empathy. a Partners of Neurotypical People <laughs> Facebook group and talk about how they are really loud and spontaneous yeah. and talk about things that are not interesting? <laughs> <laughs> so interestingly, I'm bringing out a video this, e- this, this very evening, so I guess at some point in the past when you're listening to this yes. that I've made with my husband now we're talking about our marriage and it's the first time he's ever been on my channel so it's kind of a big deal and we're talking about our marriage and how that works and something that he said that I thought was really interesting when I said what are the challenges I, I asked him what are the challenges of being married to an autistic person he was like I mean I don't really think of them as challenges of being married to an autistic person I think of them as learning to live your life with another person and the challenges that come alongside that whoever that person mm, is yeah and i think that's really a useful thing is that we're not all the same and everybody's got stuff um but going back to the question that's been asked i would say you can't you can't make somebody go and have an assessment for something that they don't want to do you sure. can encourage them by talking to them about the fact that you think that they might have autism you can leave around literature that might be helpful you can share resources videos podcasts with them that might kind of help them reach that realization but ultimately it's not okay to tell someone else how to define their brain Mm. definitely there there was this one instance um where someone someone messaged me about it's it's always very difficult to like offer people relationship and dating advice just from like (laughs) just from a message about the situation like i don't know what you're like with them I don't know what the dynamic is or the events that have come up. You know, I don't, only you know that. Um, and uh, there, there was this one instance where, like, their husband have, had left them because they thought that they were toxic or something al- along those lines. And they th- they think that it's something to do with them being autistic and undiagnosed and not knowing how to regulate their emotions and things like it's such a complex question isn't it (laughs) oh it really is because yeah this i get similar questions like i've had people emailing me really intimate details about their girlfriends because they're looking at me and going well you're autistic and i've got an autistic girlfriend let me tell you about like all their deep personal stuff and then you can tell me how to fix my relationship um and i'm like firstly not a therapist uh secondly not really keen on unpaid labor and thirdly like it's it's possible to be autistic and an asshole. That's a fact. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. So it is true. Like, by which I mean, if someone is treating you in an abusive way, their autism is almost irrelevant. You should yeah. not be living with yeah. abuse. Yeah. Um, and if someone is treating you in an abusive way, but you believe it's because of their autism that, like, like you said, it's led to them having these issues, which, you know, I carried some of that. And I'm sure my husband dealt with some stuff that wasn't ideal because of that in the well, past. Likewise. But... But you still need to hold them accountable and you still need to have your personal boundaries of what you will and won't accept sure. within a relationship, regardless of someone's neurology, right? Yeah. You're not, you're not the carer. <laughs> you're a partner. Yeah. You may, it may be some, yeah. some aspects of you know a, helping with certain things, but for the most of it, it's uh, a romantic relationship. You know, and they're, they're your partner. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's important to treat it as that. I'm responsible for me. He's responsible for him. But where he's willing to support me with stuff that I struggle with, like he can calm me down when I've had a meltdown or, you know, he can help me if an unexpected change happens and I'm going, I don't know what to do now. And he can kind of go, yeah, here's the things that I would recommend. But like, if I would not want him to tolerate abusive behavior from me and say, oh, it's okay. It's because she's autistic. I would want him to say this behavior was unacceptable and I cannot live with it. And you need to work. You need to change that. Yeah. I completely agree with that. So oh, yeah. um, that's that's our, our Instagram Q and A. Cool. What I want to ask you now, which is perhaps a very difficult question for most people, including myself, what do you want people to take away from the podcast? About from this podcast, <laughs> yeah. about we've late late diagnosis. We've we've talked about a lot <laughs> about of things. Late diagnosis, but, yeah. specifically. Um, what do I want? Let me think about this. Um, I want people to take away compassion for themselves. You know, if you're someone who has lived with autism all your life without knowing that you are autistic, you are probably also someone who has self-esteem issues and often feels like you aren't 
good enough mm. and like who you are isn't acceptable. And so I would like you to take away from this podcast that if I, as an entirely intense person who really felt like that for a really long time, have reached a place where I can say I am enough as I am, then you can too. And that there's hope that that's a place that you can sit in in the future. Brilliant. Very well spoken. So yeah, as part of the the season two, I have a couple of things. Uh, one is your song of choice. Uh, this I love this, this segment is, is all about no me. sharing Amazing. a piece of music that means something to the topic or means something to you. And you get to share the? Do you do you get to actually play it as well, or is it just a? <laughs> I, I probably won't be able to get the licensing for that, but yeah, licensing. Um, go go to your music provider of choice and yeah. listen to this song. Yeah. My favourite song is a uh, song by David Bowie, who is to begin with is a massive hero of mine because as a young quirky teenager living in a very mainstream world, I looked to him and I saw someone who also was different, and I felt hope that there was a world that I could live in and be different. As, as cheesy as that sounds, it's true. That's and the song is uh, Kooks, which is a song in which the, the kind of main lyric is, if you stay with us, you're going to be pretty kooky too, which is <laughs> a song that makes me think about the fact that as you know, now as a mother, you know, just this idea of us as a family, just in our kooky, crazy world, being who we are and it being okay. It just makes me feel happy when I listen to that song. That's beautiful. So we, we also have uh, our profile of the day, which I have not, I have not done. What does that mean? What is a profile? Just highlighting people who have who've done done something, you know, particularly. I like people. Particularly good. Social media people or people in general. Social media people on on Instagram. Okay. So like, who do I who on Instagram? Who do I think is? Well, I was going to do it, oh. but you're very welcome. To... Oh, you do it. No, no, go for it because I don't actually follow anyone because okay. I'm really antisocial. Sorry, <laughs> <It's okay. laughs> misunderstood. I think I think today we're going to to highlight uh, one of our future guests, um, autistic Callum. Callum is a really great guy. We're going to talk on the podcast soon about what is it called self advocacy. Which I think is a is a is a good point. So we were talking about earlier about you know advocating for yourself in a diagnosis situation and to doctors. It's all, all very important stuff. He also you know he talks a lot about sort of like unwritten rules in the workplace. He talks about a whole host of different things, and he's a really great creator, and he's he's well deserving of the following that he has. So yeah, that's that's our our profile of the day. Oh, cool! Yeah, I've not come across Callum before. I'll check that He's out. He's really cool. He, he makes some really great posts. So, this is coming to to the to the end of the podcast. You can find the Forty Audio Podcast on pretty much every single podcasting platform that you can hope to find it: Apple, Google, Spotify, all on there. Forty Audio Podcast. Uh, you can also visit my website where I offer an array of different things, including. Uh, doing anonymous interviews for Instagram, um, as well as modeling and public speaking. And, of course, uh, check out my my Instagram and YouTube account, which is Asperger's Growth, uh, for a lot of stuff around dating, mental health, autism, lots of different things. And, um, yeah. Uh, Also, something that I have not done before, please like and rate my podcast. (laughs) Because I have like no ratings, and uh, and uh, it's it's um, especially on Apple Podcasts that would be really great if you can give me a five stars. I'm not going to say how many stars, but five is five is the best one for me. Five's a good number, yeah, right? It's just, Why it's not just five? a nice, comfortable number, you know, to to yeah. only buy. <laughs> um, of course, thank you to all of my YouTube members and my Patreon supporters. Ella, it's been lovely to speak to you. I've, you know, I've been following your stuff for a while, and it's been, it's been great to kind of have a chat, um, <laughs> find out what 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 life yeah. is like for you, and um, find out more about your your diagnosis journey. Have you enjoyed being on the podcast? Yeah, I have really enjoyed it. I think I, I really like make. Maybe I should make a podcast. I really like podcasts. You're just kind of sitting around and having a chat, which is one of my favorite things to do. Oh. You, you definitely should. You, you do have 
you do have talent for podcasting, definitely. I mean, I'll just appear on everybody <laughs> yeah. else's because I don't really have time. <laughs> There's a lot of them. I You said it before about Doctor Who. Do you know about yeah. Mason uh, Crohn's an autism advocate? Because he's, he's doing a series no. on his podcast about Doctor Who. Oh, I think he should talk to me <laughs> about that. <laughs> so that's, that's another link there. Uh, but anyway, um, I really hope you have all got something value from this podcast. I definitely have. And, um, you know, lo- learning a bit more about what it's like to be diagnosed later in life, the challenges, the, the benefits, the ups and downs. And, um, yeah, it's been really great to talk to you, Ella, and I hope you have a lovely day. Thank you. Goodbye. See you later, peeps.